been a fun summer, but it's always nice to come back. Okay. I want you to take a minute, turn to someone next to you, tell them happy Sabbath, and tell them one great thing that happened to you this week. Eden wants to share with you one great thing that happened to her this week. He started school, and I really like school. <laughs> yes, up the hill we started school, and I think down here you guys are starting on Monday, and we like school. Uh, one other great thing is I see Mr. Colby here today. Happy Sabbath. It's great to see you here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, we have some things happening around here that we want you all to be aware of. So first, we have Creative Courtyard taking place in the courtyard after church. If you haven't joined for that yet, it's been a lot of fun. We joined um, at the one in July, had a great time. It's gonna be a little different today. We're gonna be learning to make dyes out of natural materials and how to make some very nice painted rocks. I know they brought some of the rocks for us to look at last time and they were pretty cool. Not my standard ladybug. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and then the second option happening after church today is there's a prayer encounter session. Um, so the creative courtyard's in the courtyard and the prayer encounter session is um, in the fellowship hall. And we would love to have you join us at one of those two activities. If you are joining us for one of those, we figure you might be a little hungry. So there um, is a limited catered lunch in the gym so that if you're joining us for the prayer encounters or the creative courtyard, you don't have to do it on an empty stomach. Um, each of my kids here also have an announcement. Hold it up so you can see. Adventure Club for Kids age four to nine is starting back up. Registration is one week from tomorrow here at the Chico Church from 2 to 3.30. We will have fun. <laughs> yeah. And if you were in Adventures last year and your kids have outgrown their uniforms, bring them back to us and we'll pass them on to someone else and get you a new one. <laughs> Um, or if you're not joining us again this year, if your kids graduated or for whatever reason, bring us back the uniforms to pass on. Just a sec, Kanan. Um, but otherwise, we will get your sizes and get your kids' uniforms their size. Your turn, Eden. Um, there's also a Pathfinder Club for when you're done with adventures, if you want to join. The Pathfinder Club is for kids aged 10 to 16 and is starting back up in paradise on Wednesdays. Registration is this Wednesday at 6.30 at PAA. This is a fun year to join because the next summer is the International Campery in Wyoming. I hope to see you there. All right, and lastly, but very importantly, we are celebrating with Sister Deborah as she's gonna join us through baptism today. Good morning, church family. So happy to see all your guys' faces this morning. Uh, would you guys like to join me as we praise our good, good Father and stand with us? Yeah. 
Search the world, but they couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along, put me back together. It's every desire. Now satisfied here in your Nothing better 
sweetest of love when my heart becomes green and my shame is undone your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly this place and fill the to be 
When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Oh, 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 oh. Are you ways I get? Are you ways I'm sure? seven colors up here. I hope I have the right one. If you're alert this morning and have looked at your bulletin, you notice that it says Kurt Johnson for prayer. I'm not Kurt Johnson. Clear that up. Here's why. The summer that I was 17 years old, 4th of July, my mom and dad and I planned a picnic going 60 miles away to a rodeo and we're going to have a great time. Woke up that morning and mother was sick. High fever, throwing up, just wasted. In my 17 years of judgment, I thought, she's an adult, put some water by the bedside, she'll be fine. Dad and I can go and have a good time. And dad said, no, mother needs me today. That was one of the first times I realized the responsibilities and how we act and we have love for something or somebody. That's why Kurt isn't here. If you don't know, Lupe was uh, up on a ladder. I don't know if she was picking peaches or painting the barn, but she had an encounter with the ground and broke her arm. Has been in the hospital, went home yesterday, and uh, he talked to Pastor Sharice about having prayer today, and she said, you stay home with Lupe. That's, that's where you need to be. Thus, I'm here. So if you're able or interested, please kneel with me as we pray.
Sabbath morning, August 19. Some of us woke up this morning joyous. Some of us woke up sleepy. Some of us woke up with aching, broken hearts. And I don't know a lot about technology, but I'll bet Satan and his angels have a way of hacking into our prayer line and knowing just what's going on. They're probably hovering over our church today, watching for cracks in our in our resistance, cracks in our behavior that would let them get a wedge in. Let's let not that happen. God, be close to us. Jesus, be close to us. Holy Spirit, you said you will preserve us through tough times and good times. There are many issues in this world. The main one this week has been the fires in Maui, how our hearts go out to those people because there are people in this congregation sitting here today who were in the Paradise Fire personally and know what that's like, and it's awful. Think just of the cadaver dogs. They have to give them rest because it's hot, there's glass, metal they have to walk on. Think of the re rescue people that are still looking for the hundreds of people missing. Our hearts go out to all of them. But most of all, we want to praise you for our young people today, our teachers. We appreciate the music. We appreciate the participation of each one. And we are especially excited because we have a baptism. A new sister has decided to give her life to you and follow in your footsteps. Amen. Good morning. What a blessing. Anytime I can be in this space, in this space, <laughs> then I know that God is blessing us. We are here this morning because we are welcoming several lives into the family of God. And today, in case you were, haven't picked it up from the bulletin, today is entirely a day that we are focusing on the blessings of God as he's answered our prayers. Because we have a God who answers prayers, amen? amen? And he not only gives us life when our bodies fail, but he also says by the power of his spirit, by his living water, that we can be baptized into eternal life. And I will tell you something, that if ever somebody embodied what it means to be searching for God, then Deborah is that person. She is, I believe, the answer to what God says, that all those who diligently seek him, he is a rewarder of those people. And Deborah has spent her whole life searching for God. Mm -hmm. That has been her prayer her whole life, and he has gradually led her from truth to truth until she found our church community. And she knew in her heart that this is where God led her. This is where he wanted her to make a home. And she has been with our Sabbath school class, and she's been with the Havali studying, and she has chosen that now she would like to make this not only a place where she sees God, but the place where she sees God's people. And I know, Deborah, she's my, she's my hug buddy. <laughs> We're hug buddies. Every time I see her, I, I, like, I just have to squeeze her. And Deborah, every time in every conversation, I see God shining through your life. I see how you were trying to show God to your daughter, to Ellen, and her exuberance for God. And because of Deborah's just her willingness to want to go into these waters, Ellen said, I have to go too. You can't go without me. And so Ellen is also chosen to give her life to God this morning. Amen. And so I invite you to just open up your arms to both Deborah and to Ellen as they make their home here, as they share their gifts here, that you will surround them by love with love. Deborah, yes. because you have chosen to give your life to God fully and completely, mm -hmm. because you know that he loves you and he has saved you, he's turned your life around, you have chosen to enter into these waters of baptism. And so I am honored this morning to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> My hug, buddy. <laughs> All right. And Ellen is so excited to be here today. Ellen, I know you've been going to Sabbath school and you've been learning how Jesus loves you, haven't you? Yes. Yes. And do you love Jesus with all your heart? Yeah. Yes. And do you want to serve Jesus every single day? Yeah. And do you want to learn about him and how he loves you so much and how you can love him more? Yeah. All right. Well, today I'm so excited that you get to be in these waters with your mom. And I am so excited that now, as you look at all these church members, look at all of them. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> these are your new family in Christ, okay? <laughs> and so I'm excited today that I might be able to baptize you. So I'm going to ask you to hold my arms right here like we practice. Good. And Ellen, because you love God with all your heart and he loves you with all of heaven, it is my great pleasure to baptize you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> And we are not done yet. We have another baptism, and so I'm going to be inviting Dr. Grace Harwood into the pool right now. Dr. Ginger Harlan Harwood into the pool with Grace. <laughs> so. It's always a happy Sabbath when we can come and greet each other and join in worship together. But the times in which we have that privilege of adding new people to the community, it's especially a high Sabbath. And I'd like to just mention how important this Sabbath is to me. When I was an, just about a year older than Grace is now, I was baptized in the Chico Adventist Church. And so to be standing with someone else now is a great honor. And I pray that she will find the church as generous and as gracious and as welcoming as I have. Of course, one of the people who was that gracious element to me was her great-grandmother. And through the years, not only her great-grandmother, but her grandmother. And then, actually, I had the privilege of knowing her father when he was a youngster in another state, always the fellowship with her family have been an important part of my journey with God. And today, Grace has made that decision that this journey with God and the Adventist community is to be her journey as well. We've talked a lot about the fact this is not a small decision, that as gracious and loving as we are as a group, we have our blind spots, we have our foibles, and sometimes we don't see as clearly as we need to see. Despite all that, Grace is willing to join us anyway and be part of our struggling community of faith to perceive the goodness and glory that God has laid before us. Now, because when we've studied, you have shown that you understand 
what it means not only to be a child of God, but a member of a community. Because you know that God's love is the last word on everything. And because you know that no matter what challenges lie before us and before you personally, God will be enough to get you through. Because of that, we're gathered here together to witness your baptism into this larger community of faith. Just I'm going to grab my towel here. Okay. And if you want to put your hands here. Okay. Grace, because of your clarity and your love that is a response to God's enduring and endearment to you, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of his Son, and in the name and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's now time for children's story, so I would invite any of the children who want to come down to the front to do so, and there will probably be people passing offering to the aisles for you to bring up to our children's offering box. Good job, everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath, and thank you for coming up here. <clears throat> so, the students who are in my high school classes will have heard a part of this before, but I don't think any of you are in my high school classes yet, so it'll be new to most of you. This summer, one of the things that I did with my family was go to this big teacher meeting. And if I can get the first slide up there, it has a picture of that teacher meeting. Now, when you see this slide here, if you looked really closely in that picture, I didn't take that picture, but someone did from up high there. If you looked really closely, you could see Mrs. Barch, you could see Mr. Raj, you could see Mr. McMurphy, you could probably find Mr. Hearn in there. That is all of the teachers, or at least a majority of the 
teachers at Adventist schools in North America and their families and friends. So I went to this big teaching convention along with my teacher friends that are in this room, and we prepared for the school year and were inspired, and it was really good. This building here is one of the rooms in a complex of buildings in Phoenix, Arizona. We went to the Phoenix Convention Center there. It was really hot. Now, not yet, but in a moment, our talented AV people in the back are going to move to the next slide. And that slide is going to show, if you walked out of this big complex of buildings, right across the street, something that you would see. Now, in that picture, there you go. I want you to turn to someone nearby, and I want you to tell someone <laughs> what is odd about that picture. <laughs> now, those of you who might not be able to read the sign yet, it might be a little bit subtle, or like some of the younger kids up here, it might not be completely obvious, but I think a lot of the people out there can tell what is unusual, unexpected, <laughs> ironic about this picture. So just to explain the subtlety there, that sign there, says, welcome 2023 Educators Convention, so welcoming all of the Adventist teachers. And then that can there, the blue can with the white writing, it says Bud Light, which is a type of alcoholic drink. Now, you may know that your teachers at your Adventist schools aren't supposed to drink Bud Light. Um, <laughs> and so, so that sign was out there, you know, welcoming all of us. And even if drinking Bud Light was something I really wanted to do. And that's not something that's been particularly tempting to me because of the way I was raised and my genetics or whatever. But even if I really wanted to do that, it would probably be a bad idea for me to go in there and sit down because Mr. Brown might come walking down the street because he was there at the convention too. And he would see me drinking the Bud Light and say, that's not something Mr. Rasmussen should be doing. So what I noticed about that sign is something that I talk with my students in English classes about. When you are talking with someone, and when you're writing something for someone, it's important to consider who your audience is. If I'm going to write something, I think about, well, who's going to be reading this? And I might say the same things, write the same things, but I might change how I write it for a particular audience, right? I don't think that that bar across the street from the convention center considered whom their audience was very clearly. They didn't do their market research. Now, how does this connect with church and with God and what we're talking about today? So when I look in the Bible, when I read God's word, I see Jesus saying that his message that he is giving, that he loves us and he wants to save us, and if we follow him here on earth, life is going to be better. And he wants to live with us forever in heaven. Jesus says the audience for that message is everyone. So I'm going to bring the mic up to some of you, just randomly chosen. And I'm going to say like a certain kind of person. And I want you to tell me, is, that mess is God's message, God's good news, that he wants to save us, that he loves us, that he wants to live with us forever, is that person part of the audience for that message? So uh, here we go. Um, tall people. Uh, yeah. Short people. Yeah. Cheerful people. Yeah. Grumpy people. No. <laughs> Let's get a second opinion on that one. Grumpy people. No. And this is why we have Sabbath schools. <laughs> um, people who live down the street. Yes. People who live on the other side of the world. Yeah. The audience for that message is everyone. And what that makes me think about in my life is that all of the people that I meet of all different sorts, if I get along with them easily or not, if I'm a shy person or if I'm a person who easily talks with other people, I need to remember that all of the people that I see every day, God's message is for them. They are the audience for God's message. And for you, that might look like today in Sabbath school, if you see someone that you don't know very well, God calls us to get to know those people, to become friends with them, to make sure that they know God's message for them. And when you're at school, if there are new people 
during this first week of school that's coming up. Getting to know them and making sure that they know by how you treat them that God's message is for them, that they are part of the audience. That is something God calls us to do. Now, this is the time where I would normally be asking you to go back to your seats and thank you for being up here. I say thank you for being up here, but this time I'm not asking you to go back to your seats because our church service is a little bit different today. So you're welcome to stay up here, and you're going to hear why in just a moment. Thank you, Mr. Rasmussen. I noticed how you said teachers aren't supposed to drink Bud Light, and you left it at that. So open-ended, huh? <laughs> Guys, I'm going to need you to stay here, up here just for a quick second, okay? I want to invite all of our teachers that came up today uh, to our church. I want to invite all of our teachers from Chico Oaks Avenue School, Paradise Avenue Academy to come on up to the stage. All of our teachers, come on up. Amen, amen, amen. And I'm going to give our principal, Leslie, and I haven't met Doug Brown. Doug has a great name. Doug Brown. How you doing, sir? I haven't officially met you. Douglas, good to meet you. Thank you. And I'm going to give Leslie and Doug an opportunity to introduce some of these teachers, and we're going to do something special for you guys here in a second. Okay. Well, before I enter, good morning, and um, happy Sabbath. Before I um, introduce the teachers, I want to say two things. First of all, a few weeks ago, we had a work bee at the, at the school, and I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who came and supported us. We got a lot done, and thank you for doing that. The other thing is, tomorrow is our parent orientation from 4 to 6, and I am lacking some youth to watch the little ones. If there's any youth that would love to come and support our school and help watch some little ones from 4 to 6, I pay with Dutch Brothers cards. Only, of course, for fruit smoothies. So um, let me know if there's any youth that are available to help with that. So I'm going to introduce our staff. I um, have it on my phone because my worst nightmare is forgetting someone. So if you guys will just raise your hands so they know. Um, of course, teaching um, kindergarten, and now this year TK is Mrs. Moon. Um, New to our community, and I hope that you'll get to know her and give her a warm welcome, is uh, Mrs. Van Hook. She will be teaching um, first and second grade. And then teaching third and fourth is Mrs. Maselli. I'm not sure where she is. Um, teaching fifth and sixth is Mr. Raj. Now, coming back to the fold, an oldie but a goodie, is Mr. Lynn Harris. <laughs> and he will be teaching 7th and 8th grade. Um, Mrs. Lauderdale is also going to be teaching 7th and 8th grade. She is in Montana taking her oldest to college this weekend. And then also Mr. Selby. Mr. Selby is going to be heading up our robotics program <laughs> and our money management program. Um, I don't know if Mrs. Phillips is here, but she is our beloved art teacher. Um, New to our school is also Mr. Hearn. He will be teaching our high school, our junior high kids band. So I hope you get to know him. And then back um, is Mrs. Poblano. She will be continuing our, um, our music and drama ministry. And then we also have our um, support staff that we could not do without, and I don't know why she's sitting there over instead of being up here, is um, Karina Espinoza. She is our office manager. We have Mr. and Mrs. Mora. Mrs. Mora will not be starting the year with us, but we are holding a spot, her spot. And she is home, and we are looking forward to her coming back to school soon. Um, Christina and Catalina Cameron are both of our aides. They are um, part of here. Emily Matias, she is ha heading up our after-school care. And we are bringing back Miss Cynthia to help aid with the little ones. So that is our staff this year. Thank you, Miss Leslie. Mr. Doug Brown. Thank you. First of all, I want to tell you that my wife Millie and I, this is the second Sabbath we've worshiped with you. Uh, but when I walk in and see the kids doing their thing, that makes me feel at home. And then when we all sing and lift our hearts to God, 
there's a sense of family that just comes instantly. So we are glad to be a part of this family. We are blessed this year with an awesome staff and a great group of kids. We're off now. We started on Wednesday, and uh, we are on the road already. But we have an awesome staff, and like Principal Leslie Barch, I too realize that standing in front of people, my mind can go blank just like that. So I have a cheat sheet here. Uh, and I'm going to try and go alphabetically. It makes it easier that way. I don't know if Julie Ching, Mrs. Ching, is here today. I'm not sure. Is she here? Julie Ching over there is our head of marketing, and we appreciate her work. Uh, Mr. Ayer, Jason Ayer, is also, Ayer is our PE, AD, and he also teaches geometry, and he's our vice principal. He's a busy guy. He, he would love to be here today. However, he's in Southern California with a dear friend who's getting married. So uh, his spirit is here, but uh, he's down there. Uh, next, we have Mr. David Goimer right here on the end. <laughs> Mr. Goimer does math, soccer, and this winter we're going to have a woodworking section as well. Uh, Pastor Larry Grock right here is our Bible and chaplain uh, on campus, Bible teacher and chaplain, and he's going to be teaching lots of things, but we also have some other people to mix up Bibles, so it isn't just one person, which is always a good idea. <laughs> but he has the heart of the kids, and he, he uh, shares with them the love of Jesus. Next, we have our music teacher, new music teacher this year, Mr. James Andrew Hearn, who is doing our music, and we're happy to have him this year. And then we have Ms. Laura Moss right here in the middle. She is doing science, algebra, algebra one? Algebra. Oh, okay. I looked at last year's schedule. And art. She's also our art teacher. And then we have Mr. Sean McMurphy, who is there. And Sean does history and uh, Bible. Uh, we are also happy to have Mr. Raj in, in Paraj. Close. You got it right. You got it. <laughs> I do better when just you and me. <laughs> Uh, and he is coming up to teach Bible, and we appreciate the opportunity to share him here with the local elementary school. <laughs> Way down on the end, we are happy to have Mr. Monty Nystrom as our sp uh, sp Spanish teacher, and also he does maintenance, and he knows more about that campus than anybody on the face of the earth. <laughs> Next, we have here uh, Mrs. Glenda Purdy. She is our receptionist at the front desk, and she's also my administrative assistant, and she will save me a lot this year. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Caleb Rasmussen, who did our children's story this morning. He teaches English and photography and cinematography. And finally, Mrs. Megan Taylor, and she is our registrar. Oh, back there. Okay. We are blessed. We are blessed with a great staff. We are blessed with awesome students. But most of all, we ask an interest in your prayers because we know whatever good happens on our campus is because of God, not because of us. So we ask him to take us out of the picture but for him to be present, show up on our campus, and he's already done that. Thank you, teachers. Thank you for what you guys will be doing in our Christian schools and our academies. We haven't forgotten about our public school uh, teachers, and we want to say the best for last. So if you are a public school teacher, we also want to invite you to come on up at a high school, at a middle school. Maybe you're teaching at Chico State. Please come on up. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Do we have any public school teachers?
teachers. All right. And Ms. Della, can you tell us what you teach? <clears throat> as soon as I compose myself, yes. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate this because when you teach in the public system, you don't get the privilege of talking about Jesus like you guys do. Don't ever waste an opportunity. I teach with California Virtual Academies. I teach eighth grade. I tell my students I'm a little crazy because you know you have to be crazy to teach eighth grade. <laughs> right, John? Um, and so thank you. God bless all of us. And kids. Now, kids, this is where I need your help. I need you to help me surround your teachers or maybe future teachers, and we are going to lay hands and pray for them. If you are out there and you have been taught or will be taught by one of these teachers, I also invite you to please come on up. We are going to surround our teachers. Our students are going to surround our teachers, lay hands on our teachers, and we will have a special prayer of dedication for them. So teachers, these are the lives that you have impacted, that you will impact, and we thank you so much for your dedication and your love. All right, youth, youth, go ahead and lay hands. Lay hands on your teachers, lay hands on your teachers, and we will have our senior pastor have a word of prayer for them. All right, all right. Will you bow your heads with me as we dedicate these amazing educators? Our loving Heavenly Father, God, we know that you are not just our friend. You are our first teacher. You are the ones who put the law of your love into our hearts and you have promised us that everything that we need, you will give to us. And I pray, God, that that teaching heart that is yours will also be these teachers. And that you will pour into the teachers and the educators, those who are here standing, those who are there sitting, Lord. And maybe they didn't feel brave enough to be up front because they didn't think that they were a part. But we see you out there, every one of you. We love you, teachers, educators. May you pour into them, Lord. May they know by hands and, and by students and by parents, may they, be, may they be told verbally how much they are appreciated during this school year. I know, God, that it is very hard to feel appreciated as a teacher sometimes. You, Lord, were the greatest teacher, and the ones that you loved and came to give a message of peace to, they forsook you. Lord, I pray that these teachers never feel forsaken, that they always feel that they are part of a greater community, that they will not be afraid to let their light shine, whether they're teaching in one of our Adventist schools or whether they are in a public school or a charter school, whether they are homeschooling or whether they are on a college campus, Lord. May they be able to love their children into a relationship with you. Even when they can't teach it, may they model it, God in all that they do. And may you be with us, God, as their congregations, their church congregations. May we be those who support them, who encourage them, who resource them with everything that they need in order to do a job well done. We thank you, God, that there are educators, people who are willing to share and pour into our children. We thank you, God, that you pour into us just as mightily May there be an overflowing of your love this morning on every teacher, every administrator, every educator here in our midst, God. And may they know that you will be their strength this school year and beyond. We bless them, Lord. We ask you to bless them. And may they feel it every day of the school year. In Jesus' name, amen.
just Did announced it with the merger. Give yeah. me a second. Let me. Oh, oh, oh. And it's just, oh. It's just this one right here, right? 1817? Yes, sir. 1817. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. My name is Benji. And I'm going to read the verse today. And it's from Psalms 118.17. It goes this. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> I can't tell you uh, how many times over the last uh, 10 months or so my wife has read that verse to me. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for the opportunity to stand here before you and before this congregation. <clears throat> Thank you for the promise that you give that when I open my mouth, they'll be your words, not my own. Lord, let someone hear you today. Let even just one heart be touched. One decision be made to live a life that glorifies you. Amen. Three biblical principles that can help you when you're faced with a challenge. Have any of you ever faced a challenge? Anyone? Anyone? Um, a challenge can be physical. It can be spiritual. It can be emotional, financial. It can be uh, with a relationship. You know, uh, some people, and not me, but some people are challenged in, in the relationship of a marriage. I say, I say not me, not because I'm perfect, far from it. My wife, she's probably challenged by marriage <laughs> every single day, but, but um, she's just absolutely angelic. And so for me, you know, marriage isn't necessarily a challenge because I'm just so lucky to be married to her. But my challenge was medical. But whatever your challenge will be or is, I, I just want to share with you today three, again, three biblical principles that can, um, you know, that we can rely on to help us through those challenges. Number one, we serve a sovereign God. Amen. We serve a powerful God a God of love, a God of forgiveness, a God of reconciliation. Reconciliation, I'm, I'm reminded of the story of the prodigal son. It's familiar to most of us, and, and, and if you don't know it, go home today, or if you do know it, but just remind yourself about it. Luke uh, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. The prodigal son, I mean, what a story of reconciliation. And we serve a God of healing. October 22nd, 2022 is a day that will live in infamy for my wife and me. It was a Sabbath morning. <clears throat> and uh, my stomach just wasn't feeling very good. I, I don't know what it was. I, I, was. I did make breakfast for us that morning, but I don't think that had much to do with it. <laughs> Whatever the problem was, I wasn't feeling very good, and, and I had to uh, make a quick trip into the bathroom where my breakfast made a, a, a violent reappearance. Um, <laughs> and, and as often is the case, I felt a little bit better after that, right? Uh, I, I, but I went over back to, to my bed, and I sat down, and almost immediately I had to get back up and go back into the bathroom. And, and this happened you know, two or three times, and my wife was getting more and more concerned, and, and, 
and she ended up, she dialed 911. So <coughs> she had her cell phone with her dialing 911 while running over to the neighbor's house to, to ask for help. And the lady answered the door, and the husband, you know, she, the, the lady screamed over, James is passed out, James is passed out, he needs help. Hurry up. Of course, her, her husband was in the shower at the time, like, what? <laughs> but uh, they made their way over to the, to the house, and they were trying to help me to stay alert, stay aware, trying to assess my situation uh, until the paramedics got there. And they asked me all kinds of questions and running tests and whatever. I wasn't able to answer them. I was too weak and just out of it. But they, they threw me on a stretcher, put me in an ambulance, and, and raced me over to the emergency room here at Enlo. And, um, of course, there the ER doctor was trying to get information out of me. I couldn't answer him either, and, which confused him. I mean, you know, he needed some information to be able to access, assess what was wrong with me, but uh, I, I just couldn't answer him. And they ran their tests, you know, they ran their blood work and everything, and that's when he started realizing why I wasn't able to answer him. Okay, I mean, some of the numbers, that, the markers that they read, and I know there's a lot of medical professionals here, doctors, nurses, and so on, and so if I get something wrong, forgive me. I mean, um, I, I, I'm just a dentist, so. <laughs> Let all the real doctors correct me after I'm done, right? But um, some of these markers, there's something with your pancreas, it, 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 it's a reading that should be around 300. Okay, mine was 60,000. Okay, ma math is hard, and so I'll just say, you know, that's bigger than 300, right? 60,000. Okay, uh, my blood glucose levels, th th it should be around 100, anywhere from 90 to say maybe 115 or so, whatever. Mine was pushing 700. And so, you know, this, this clued them in that, that, that something was wrong. You know, a lot of doctors, um, they don't see levels like this. In their whole career, they don't see numbers like this. And if they do, uh, it, it's in one of two situations. It's either in a gunshot wound or an automobile accident. You know, scenarios where your body has just been blown or ripped to pieces. Okay, I should have been dead My pancreas had quite literally exploded inside me. Um, for those of you who aren't medical uh, in your careers or don't have that knowledge, the pancreas is responsible for two major functions, okay? One, it creates and secretes insulin, which most of us will know that's related to your blood glucose level, right? That helps balance out the sugar levels in your blood. The second major uh, function of the of pancreas is to help with digestion, okay? It, um, it, it creates this enzyme that helps to digest, you know, carbohydrates, fats, proteins. And that gets injected into your small intestine. And it also injects bicarbonate, which is a very basic, you know, acidic and basic on the pH scale. It's very basic and it helps to neutralize the stomach acids that are coming through. So, without your pancreas, i.e. after it blows up, now my abdominal cavity is full of all this liquid. A healthy pancreas, by the way, will, will produce about eight cups every day of this pancreatic digestive juice. So now my abdominal cavity is full of that stuff. My pancreas had digested itself and now it was digesting or chemically burning my other organs not a gentle massage, okay, that did not feel good. It's quite abrupt and uh, quite painful. Um, but so they quickly took me from the ER into ICU where they hooked me up in with all these tubes and wires and machines. Uh, they were doing everything they could, but my body was shutting down. Okay, obviously my pancreas wasn't working. My gallbladder stopped functioning. My, my kidneys just all, but, you know, they completely shut down. Uh, my heart was malfunctioning. My lungs were 80% covered in this fluid. Remember, this is digestive fluid, 80% covering my lungs. So um, 
you know, my body was, was under attack and, and, and shutting down. And I, and I was laying there in the ICU, and my wife brought me my phone. Uh, obviously, she knew that I was weak and I wasn't in a condition, I wasn't going to be, you know, particularly, uh, you know, ready to be, to participate in a conversation, but she knew it was uh, coming from a good friend of mine, and she thought I would want to take this, this phone call. It was coming from uh, Pastor Mark Finley. Uh, he and I served together at, at our church in Virginia. Uh, but he was calling to offer some words. and He had heard about my situation and wanted to encourage me. And he said, he said, James, we serve an incredible God. One who hears our prayers and one who will heal us. And he told me uh, something else. You know, you know, he, and he, something that I had heard in, in his sermon in, a, in, a, in the past, uh, he said that healing may come in one of three forms. It might be an immediate, complete physical healing, right? He's able to do that. Is our God able to do that? Amen. Amen. Uh, or it might be a little bit more gradual. It might be a healing that takes place over time. No less miraculous, by the way, but it might just take a little bit of time uh, the third form of healing might be one that takes place in eternity. One, you know, where there'll be no more sickness. <clears throat> Excuse me. There'll be no more sickness, no more death. And he said to me, James, we don't know. We don't know which form of healing God has in store for us, but we can be assured that one way or another, healing will take place. He told me that the uh, American division leaders were praying for me at their daily meetings at the general conference, you know, just encouraging me that people were taking me to the throne of God in prayer. And uh, we, we prayed together, and he reminded me that they would be in continual prayer for me. And that's what actually brings me to our, our second principle. Remember, three biblical principles that can help us to face our challenges. Number one, we serve a sovereign God, a powerful God. Remember, a God of love, forgiveness, and reconciliation, a God of healing. Number two, we have a strong support system in our friends, our family, our church family. You know, there's sometimes when our challenge might seem so intense that we just can't help ourselves. We, we might find ourselves in, in a place that's so dark and we feel lonely and, and we can't even sense God's presence at all. Maybe that burden is so heavy and we feel ourselves crumbling under its weight. The Bible tells us in Matthew 18, 20 that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is in the midst of them. Did you hear that? God himself is in the very midst of us when we come together and call upon him. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 <clears throat> say two are better than one for when they, if they fall, one will lift up his companion. And, and if two are better than one, certainly 200 are better, right? Again, that, that math. Uh, Heather wasn't expecting to call an ambulance that Sabbath morning. She wasn't expecting, she certainly wasn't expecting to see me laying in a hospital bed struggling to breathe. But she was there for me. She was strong for me. I mean, she really stepped up. I didn't have to face my challenge alone. And that wasn't easy for her. You know, she was with me all day in the hospital answering questions from doctors and nurses, uh, researching medical terminology and treatment options, handling all the logistics of it. And when they made her leave, you know, I was in the ICU, so she couldn't stay overnight, 
uh, initially they wouldn't let her stay. I was just too critical. But when they made her leave, you know, she would go home and just lay in bed and cry all night. She was scared. She didn't know if I would be there in the morning when she got back to the hospital. Uh, because on more than one occasion, more than one doctor had pulled her aside and, and maybe one of you were, were in that small group with her and, and family where the doctors, as gently as they could, they had to let her know of the very real potential that, you know, I may not survive. You know, we were only married in 2019, so I don't know if you're ever ready, but she certainly was not ready to become a widow. But she wasn't alone either. Uh, her sister, Melissa, came to support us. And now her sister is a uh, nurse practitioner, a critical care nurse practitioner. And so that was very helpful because she was help us, helping us to understand what was, what was going on. Um, but she just dropped everything and came from Fresno. Uh, and she was with us every single day in the hospital. And then she would go home at night and just hold Heather and, and just comfort her and she did this for a month or more straight total disregard for for her own uh, responsibility you know she had a job a house her own friends her own life but she just dropped everything to come and support her sister and me and it was melissa who called my sisters <coughs> most of my family and friends are uh that i grew up with anyway i have friends here but uh I grew up on the East Coast. And so Melissa called my sisters, told them, and, and they were on the next available flights. They came out to, to be with us, dropped, you know, their own responsibility as of families and careers and everything. Um, friends that, that I've known since first grade and cradle role. By the way, the students and, and the teachers that were here today, I'll just take a minute to kind of affirm them because the friendships you're forming now the Adventist education system is great, right? Because those are lifelong friendships. You're going to be brothers and sisters to these people for the rest of your life and embrace that. It's, I, so I had this, this whole group of friends that, that came uh, from across the country to be with me. Uh, my, my high school coach, who now works at PUC, he heard about it. He immediately canceled all his classes for that day, hopped on his motorcycle, and came up from PUC. That's kind of a long, you know. Uh, but he came up to be with me. A woman I used to work with 10, 15 years ago, uh, she was actually my chairside assistant. Through the years, she's become a very close friend of mine, a spiritual sister, and she uh, flew in from Louisiana. Uh, so here, the, the ICU wing of the hospital, which is full of people there, coming to support me, and, and, and the doctors and nurses, they were coming to me, you know, do you know how many people are out there? You know, there's just, there must have been 20 or more people out there just to support me, and that was before you as my Chico uh, church family kind of found out what was going on, and uh, like I said earlier, a lot of you are medical professionals. Maybe you work at Enlo, nurses and doctors and administrative professionals. But now you guys were coming to start to visit me and, you know, the, my doctor, my medical team were, were, were seeing their own colleagues come and show a, a personal interest in my well-being. And so, you know, they're probably thinking, who, who is this guy, <laughs> right? Um, and then uh, there, there were a lot of you who aren't medical people, but you came to visit as well, just to visit with me, pray with me. You came to anoint me. Um, and that meant a lot, you know, cards and, and flowers and, and, and prayers and, and, and balloons and all these kinds of things just keep, kept coming and coming and coming. And, and that was really... Uh, special um some of some of you were bringing supplies to my house you know i had family and friends uh staying at the house and you'd bring food or extra blankets and pillows toiletries whatever you thought people might need and that was a real blessing my neighbors were bringing in my mail they were cutting my grass for six months by the way 
just, they, and I never asked them to do this, right? They just saw a need and they filled it. And they were having their own church families uh, pray for us, you know? So not just their local congregation, but their extended church families, you know? So we had the Adventist world and people from all over the world, by the way, that didn't even know us. We didn't know them. They, they were praying for us by name and not just a one-off, you know? They would follow up day after day. How's he doing? How are you guys doing? These are people we never even met. Amen. And we want you to know what a difference that made. What a difference it made <clears throat> to have such constant love being poured into us. We were facing a real challenge, but our cups were never low. Because of your presence, because of your presence, we were reminded of God's loving care. And, and I do want to take just a, a, a moment here as an aside because I want to remind us, I want to remind us, myself included, that not everyone has a nuclear family. Not everyone has such an incredible circle of friends, right? There are plenty of people who would be completely alone if not for us. So I just encourage you to be God's arms. Embrace each other in that love. Because it, <coughs> it really makes a difference. Deb, I, I'm not sure the, the, the people that were baptized today, you should know that you're coming into an amazing family. They will show you <coughs> incredible love. Three biblical principles. Remember, we're working on three biblical principles that we can count on when we're facing challenges. Number one, we serve a sovereign, powerful, loving God, a God of healing. We have an incredible support system in our family, our church family. We have that support system where we can be there for one another. Uh, number three is faith. Faith. Uh, we were life flighted from Enlo to USC. And uh, during my flight, my, my blood glucose dropped significantly and no one on the plane noticed it we landed in LAX we flew out of our little airport here in Chico landed in LAX put me in an ambulance and drove me to USC which took every bit as long as the flight with traffic and all that but um, it wasn't until we got admitted into the hospital I was laying there in the in the hospital bed that Heather noticed that I was low you see her her brother about 15 16 years ago uh, was diagnosed type 1 diabetic. And remember, I have no pancreas at this point because it had blown up. So by definition, I'm not making insulin. So by definition, I had become diabetic like that. Uh, and so Heather had this experience, and she knew, you know, she and her family are well-versed in uh, diabetic emergencies, and, and, and they can notice when a diabetic is in danger. And so she called the nurse who tested my blood glucose. I was at 32. Remember, that number should be around 100, and there's some significance to being at 32. Um, at 70, as you're dropping down from 100, you get down to 70, you start losing brain cells. I don't have very many to lose in the first place, but I start, you know, you start losing brain cells at 70. Okay, at 54, you need immediate medical attention because as you drop further down to 49 through 41, now you're more heavily, you're, you know, at a higher risk for uh, falling into what they call a diabetic coma. Okay, so you could die from 49 to 41. And yet here I was at 32. And, you know, I, I didn't really realize what was happening. I, I was alert. I was aware of my surroundings. I shouldn't have been, but I was. I, and I was, I was sweating, but I really didn't know what was happening. I didn't even know. Um, but Heather did. <laughs> Thank God Heather did. 
Um, you know, how often are we led astray without even knowing? The devil is an absolute master of subtlety. Bit by bit, ever so slowly, imperceptibly, he sort of eases us in a wayward direction. And we don't even notice it. But thank God, someone does. Thank God, our Heavenly Father does, and he fights for us. Jesus, our heavenly advocate, he sees our need and he fights for us before we even ask him. Isaiah 65, 24, before they finish praying, I'm answering, before they even call my name, I know their needs. So Heather calls the nurse, the nurse comes in and tests my blood uh, uh, sugar, and she says, oh, no problem. We'll just have him chew on these sugar tablets, and he'll be fine in just a little while. And this, this is when my advocate, I keep pointing to my wife, praise God for wives, but that's when my advocate really sprung into action and took control. No! You're not going to give him sugar tablets. He needs immediate IV glucose. You will get the D50, and you will get it now. <laughs> I mean, does anybody here know Heather? I mean, she's not usually very assertive. She's, not, she, you know, she's very loud-mouthed, right? You know, she's a very quiet woman. And so, you know, at that point, I knew, you know, I'm laying there in the, in the hospital. I couldn't move. By the way, I mean, I'm so weak. I wasn't able to really move for six months. I laid here like this. Um, but that's when I knew that she was in control. Have you ever been in, in charge or, you know, someone told you you were in charge of a project? You're nervous about it. You don't know how it's going to work out until you find that one person that really knows what they're doing. At least for me, you know, the secret to success is delegate because, because I wouldn't know how to, but you find that person that's able to handle it, and then you can just relax because you know you're confident in that person. You're confident in their ability, and that's how I felt when Heather took charge like that. I thought, okay, she's got this. I can kind of let go and relax. You know, Heather, Heather's in control. Um, now, that's in no way, shape, or form. That's no way meant to undermine the abilities or or the, the, the knowledge of the nurse. It's just that Heather was so aware. She had seen this before with her brother. She knew what a diabetic emergency looked like. You know, God has a way of preparing us, doesn't he? He prepares us in advance for the challenges that we might face, ways that we would never even imagine. But, uh, okay, so we went from Enlo to USC and then on to Stanford uh, and then to UCSF. Um, this was over several months, by the way. Um, you've got to be sick to spend that much time in a hospital. They, they want you in, they want to fix you and get you out. But I was, in, I was there for months. And um, anyway, we, we, wit we witnessed so many miracles. Too many to go into great detail uh, today, but... Uh, so many ways that God has touched people's lives. We prayed for ways to be a blessing to our medical team. And, you know, our nurses opened up to us. They were telling us about the trials that they were facing. And Heather and I prayed together. We really built our friendship, went to a new level because we were praying much more intimately, much more intensely than ever before. Um, <coughs> but uh, just remember, you know, our, 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 our principle here that I'm working on is faith, right? And I remember laying there, and I had plenty of time to think. I had plenty of time to pray. And I was praying, God, if you have anything useful left for me to do, if you have any other, you know, work that you'd have me do for you, let me live. But if I can be of more use to you in my death 
and, and, I, and I paused. I'll tell you, in that moment in my prayer, I, I paused because do you really want to go there? I mean, are you, are you praying that in, since it's hard to pray that in sincerity. But I did. I, I said, you know, if, if your kingdom can be grown more through my death, then take me. If my death will grow the faith of someone else, you know, I, I, I can't say I welcome it, but I accept it, and I, and I, and I want your will in my life. Um, faith, as we're told in, in Hebrews 11, 1, is the essence, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we were being given, God was giving us a lot of evidence, but faith is more than just believing that God's going to give you what you ask for or that he's going to do what you ask him to do. Uh, I'm reminded of the story of the fiery furnace. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar (coughs) had erected this golden image, right? And he said, when you hear this music, everyone is to bow down and worship this image. Well, and if you... If you're familiar with the story, if you're not, go home again. Another reading assignment, Daniel 3. Okay? It's a great story. Daniel's friends say, no, we're not going to bow down. They refused to bow down. And the king reminded them. He said, you know, you're going to be thrown into this fiery furnace if you don't bow down to this image. What was their response? Do you remember? They said, well, we're not going to do it. They said, furthermore, king, we know, yeah, you can throw us into that furnace, but our God is able to save us, and he will deliver us from your hands. And here's the kicker, O king, even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we're going to remain faithful. We're not going to bow down to your image. I mean, that's faith. Right? That's faith. We know that he's able to save us. We know he loves us. We know he's capable. We know he loves us enough to do it. But we also know that our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. And so we rest in him. We rest in his love. Not in our presupposed outcomes. Not in our preferred results. But in his wisdom. We rest in his love, his care for us, because we know he's handling it. And we can just relax. God is in control. In closing, remember, we're, we're exploring three biblical principles that can help us when we're facing a challenge. Number one, what were they? Number one, we serve a powerful, sovereign, loving God a God of healing, a God of reconciliation. That healing, by the way, can be spiritual as well, right? True healing. Number two, we have a strong network of support in our family, our friend, our church family. And number three, our faith allows us perfect peace, true rest in his love toward us, in his power. And so in whatever challenge we may face, we know that he is able to see us through. He's able to heal us. We know that he's able to protect us, that he's able to save us. We know that he is able. To carry me through 
He's able, He's able, I know He's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Father, we, we lift up and, and praise your name. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for your power in our lives. And we're blessed by your spirit of true healing. We thank you for placing in our lives brothers and sisters in Christ. And we humbly thank you for the faith that you place in our hearts faith in your power, faith to know that you are able to see us through any challenge we face. Thank you, Father, and be with each one of us as we go out into the world this week and find ways to express your love to others.
It's not time to be silent, don't you dare hide your light. There's a world outside your window, so 